Fuck these motherfuckers. It's time to hey, go. All I wanna do is fucking eat. If we're not practicing the beat, somebody, we're practicing the beat. Everybody. Nowhere to run and nowhere to hide for four quarters. They got to see us in our house for four quarters. They got to look us in the eye for four. This is about us and our family and our house. This is about us. This is our mentality. We ain't backing down. We ain't running. Set a tone. Send a message. This is our house. Physical toughness wins in football now. And if you in this room, you got it. If you come in here, you better believe in it. Because this physical toughness is what makes the difference. Elite focus. That's all I'm doing. The guy across from me, I fix to whip his ass. Not in my box. Not today. It's about us. It's about our family. We attack. You take that helmet and you strike him. And you strike him. And you strike him. That's how you get respect. Y'all have to pick the shit out of him. Physically, physically, I want to break him. So how about the fucking dogs? That's what I told him. All right, friends, we are back, fresh off of SEC Media Days. We finally got back home. We're settled in, and we've just been thinking about just how exciting it's actually starting to feel. Like, I looked at my wife today and said, you know what? I'm actually starting to feel the excitement of toe meeting leather and kicking off the 2023 season. I hope you're feeling it, too. Thank you for being here with us on this Wednesday evening. My name's Randy. And we are just here to take a look back at the week it was in Georgia football and what lies ahead. And we've got a lot to get to this week. I certainly spent some time today in the lab grinding away for you good people, just trying to make sure that we had everything ready to go for our first show back at home since returning from SEC Media Days. And that's where we should start, is what's going on or what happened last week at SEC Media Days. Now, there was a lot of glitz and a lot of glamour. That's the, the period of time where the coaches show up, they go through the car wash, they talk to hundreds of people. Um, you know, the, it's just all for show. But as the coaches repeatedly told us, that was our day. That was the media's day. So they wanted to come and promote their universities, their stories, their players, and set out their narrative for the coming 2023 season. And for the most part, the coaches did that with just one or two exceptions. I have to say that one of my biggest takeaways, this was my first trip to SEC Media Days. And one of my biggest takeaways was just how impressive not only the University of Georgia player representatives were, but how impressive all of the player representatives were. I mean, it didn't matter if I was talking to Eli Cox of Kentucky or if I were talking to Spencer Rattler of South Carolina, or Joe Milton of Tennessee, right? All of these individuals, all of them, just showed up and represented their universities very, very well. I really had a good time. We enjoyed our time in Nashville. Nashville was a wonderful host, host city. Uh, the Grand Hyatt was a wonderful place to stay and hold the event. There was plenty of room. No one felt crowded or crunched or anything like that. So, Outside of the construction zone, that is Nashville, which, as a couple of the coaches alluded to, that's just the pain of progress in that area. Everything was really, really top shelf last week at SEC Media Day. So hats off to the SEC for putting together a wonderful event, and hats off to all the schools that showed up, all the coaches and all the players who represented their universities in a very, very good light. And with that said, I mean, we're, we're a week out. So there are a lot of things that have already made the news or hit the headlines. But what I wanted to do was sort of share just, you know, a couple of anecdotes from my week, mention a couple of things that really stood out to me uh, that the Georgia players or, or Kirby Smart said um, at SEC Media Days and what a couple of the other coaches said too. Because, I mean, it is talking season and there certainly was a lot of that going on last week. But there were also a few nuggets that you could take away from it and sort of develop your own idea of where we're headed in the 2023 season. I mean, you know, the coaches and players are there to push their story, and that's exactly what they should be doing. But also, it's a way for us to, and I mentioned this on one of my previous, I guess it was two weeks ago, one of my previous uh, live streams, it's not always what they say, but what they don't say, or how they say, how they deliver the message that they're there to deliver. So again, there was a lot to take away from it. And 
it was just it was a wonderful event, and I'm very very grateful and thankful that I got to go. With that said, let's just let's use let's take a look here, and I'm gonna put some stuff up on the screen for you so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but what I want to do is take a look at what happened last week. Now, of course, at SEC Media Days, we're talking about the kind of stuff that. Uh, again, we're previewing the season, you know. So when you look, the votes came in strong. Our dogs are well represented. If we take a look here, you can see that there are bulldogs all over these SEC um, teams, these preseason all SEC teams. Just on the offensive side of the ball alone, you have Mims, Truss, McConkie, Bowers, Milton, Van Pran, Moat. And Ratledge. And I mean, that is a pretty good way to start if you're if you're on the offensive side of the ball. And if you take a look at the defensive side of the ball, the dogs are just as well represented. Michael Williams is on that list in the Zier Stackhouse, Malachi Starks, Jamon Dumas Johnson, Smile Munden, Javon Bullard, Kamari Lasseter, and Walker is there on the third team at linebacker as well. So there's no doubt. No one thinks that Georgia is not talented or capable enough to get things done this year on the football field. And as we talked to the coaches and we sort of made our way through the week, you know, there are some narratives that popped out to us. And after we heard all of the coaches say what they were going to say and, and figured out what we wanted to hear from the, from the players, asking them our questions, we got around to the voting and the predicted order of finish. So let's start with the official predicted order of finish. We'll pop that up on the screen here. And you can see that to some people's surprise, Alabama was picked yet again to win the West. A lot of people thought that was going to be LSU. But at the end of the day, the media types, they went with Alabama yet again. And, I mean, it's hard to bet against Nick Saban. It, it just is. We know they're talented. We know that he has a track record of getting the most out of his team every year. So I guess that's not that big of a surprise. But there was a real push all week that LSU would get that top vote. Texas A&M checks in at third. Ole Miss four. Arkansas five. Auburn six. And Mississippi State at the bottom at seven. And then if we look at the Eastern Division, this one, uh, except in the middle – you know, you could probably guess. So Georgia won the vote in the East. Tennessee was picked to finish second, South Carolina third, Kentucky, then Florida, Missouri, and Vanderbilt bringing up the bottom of the East. And if you look at predicted order of finish overall for the SEC champion, the media types, we voted that Georgia is the favorite to win the SEC this year. That should come as a surprise to exactly no one. Now, with that said, here was my individual ballot. And I wanted to pop this up on the screen and just take a look at it because, it, as I put here, having a little fun, I mean, it was pretty straightforward. Georgia's the favorite in the East. There are a lot of reasons for that. Tennessee is a dangerous team, but um, we don't know exactly what they're going to be. I think they're going to take a step back. Uh, but I still put them at two just simply because – of what they showed us last year and what we believe we're going to see this year. So here's where I differed from some folks. Uh, I have Kentucky at three. Now, to be completely honest, I debated whether or not Kentucky should actually be at two here. But at the end of the day, I went off of what I saw on the field last year. And the reason Kentucky was in the consideration for that two spot was because of what we believe uh, that they have changed. They have added talent to their roster. The offensive line is definitely going to be better, and they are going to play a physical brand of football. It would not surprise me in the least if these two teams were flip-flopped, if Kentucky finished second in the East and Tennessee finished third. But as you can see here, I had a little fun. I threw up the I don't know shoulder shrug emoji here for the for the rest of the division because honestly, with the exception of maybe, well, even six and seven, you could argue, uh, you know, could flip-flop. But between South Carolina and Missouri, I think they're really um, right there together. I really do think Missouri has improved. And although South Carolina has overachieved in its first two years under Shane Beamer, 
I just don't know that they're going to be able to make that separation, you know, that that's that drastic above and beyond what Missouri or even what Florida could do. And so I put Florida at six because I expect them to be uh, still figuring it out a little bit. And Vanderbilt, although they're building, is still going to come in last in the east. And in the west, after joking about it all spring, ultimately I was one of the ones that chose Alabama to win the west, LSU at two. Again, if, if the final results work out differently and this works out to where LSU wins the west, I will not be surprised at all mostly because they have a proving, proven entity at quarterback. Even if they're trying to better that situation, they still know what they have there. Whereas Alabama, I don't think that they do. I just think that overall, everything that makes Alabama Alabama is going to be the difference in who wins the West just this year. That and the fact that LSU has to go to Tuscaloosa. I took a uh, kind of a bold stance. I felt like it was a, little, a bit of a bold stance to put A&M at three. I think Petrino uh, and Fisher, I think it will work. Um, I think they will be better. They certainly have talent. The question with them is do they have the depth? And I think they're probably going to end up in that three slot. And the same thing here for the rest of them. You could kind of throw them in a blender beyond this point. But I went with Ole Miss, Arkansas, Auburn, and then Mississippi State. Very easily, Auburn could be four, Ole Miss could be five, Arkansas six, any variation right there. I think you could, you know, make an argument and nobody's going to run you out of the building. And besides, nobody really cares about these preseason predictions unless you're wrong anyway. Am I right? That's how that works. So that's how the voting went down in Tuscaloosa, or I'm sorry, in Nashville last week is the All-SEC teams got chosen. And as I said, this is talking season. As you can see here, since, as I was scrolling down the Twitter page, you can see here, Peter Burns of SEC This Morning flat out said on SEC This Morning, I'm still taking Georgia over the field. And I think that's how most people in Nashville felt last week. Um, and why wouldn't you? Because as it says here on Twitter, Kirby has led Georgia to 29 wins over the past two seasons, the most in a two-year span in SEC history, and it's tied for the most, the best span in college football history. So they clearly have things rolling in Athens, and there's no sign that any of that is going to change anytime soon. Uh, just a quick little plug here. If you're not following us on Twitter, go ahead and jump over there and give us a follow. We are at a damn beast. We try to keep things fun and lively over there. Uh, it's a quick and easy way to reach me. I'll get right back with you as soon as I get the notification. And as you can see, we do fun things like this poll here. So it's a fun place to be. Come on over and check it out. And as you can see, we're talking about on the swivel, which is what we're doing here tonight. And that sort of brings us to the end of the nuts and bolts of what uh, SEC Media Days was last week. Now, with that said, if we start to think about what happened that we can't put on Twitter, right? That I can't just uh, pop up here for you to look at. I would point you to just a couple of anecdotes and a couple of quotes that we saw or heard last week. And, and the other thing that was prevalent, I said there were narratives that were being developed over the week. And one of the biggest ones that was being developed last week was the fact that Georgia is clearly the standard in the conference right now. I mean, in the world of the internet and the interwebs, there are lots of fans of other teams that want to argue this point. But the fact is that the University of Georgia, the program that Kirby Smart has built, is the standard in the SEC right now. And seeing as how the SEC is the top conference in the country, Georgia is the standard for college football right now. There is no dispute there among people who actually know the game. The coaches, beat writers who cover these teams, that was the thing that just kept coming to the top. Some coaches stepped right up and said it. Others didn't come right out and say it, but alluded to it. But you had everyone from Brian Kelly stepping up, the head coach at LSU, stepping up to the microphone and saying, we will be Alabama. Brian Kelly also said, we will be able to compete with Georgia. Can we do that right now? No. No. So clearly, for Brian Kelly, the champions of the West in 2022, 
his LSU Tigers. They view the Georgia Bulldogs in their program as the standard in the conference. Shane Beamer alluded to it. Hugh Freeze alluded to it. Uh, he mentioned them by name, actually. So there is no doubt among people who actually know the sport and take it seriously that the University of Georgia is the standard right now in college football. And again, I'm not running out on any limb here to share this news with you. I'm not breaking news here. I'm just sharing. This was a narrative that was something everyone was talking about, is how do they stack up against Georgia? That was the bottom line. One of the other really cool things that I heard last week had to do with everybody's All-American, Brock Bowers. Now, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to ask Brock a couple of questions and I'll share those later on, you know, different platforms on shorts or maybe over on TikTok. We'll get that out to you. But um, it was, I was very interested in his answers. And those sessions were great. And as I said, all the players represented themselves very well. But it was what happened after the little breakout session interviews with the players that really stuck in my head. I was back at my laptop right there on the front row of the Grand Hall where all the coaches came in for the main part of media days. And I was banging away on the keys, doing the stuff, you know, live tweeting or reporting or sharing some video or whatever it was. And the people around me were talking. And again, we're all close together, so you can hear these conversations. And the thing that just made me sort of laugh, makes me smile right now, is I heard uh, some veteran reporters talking over my shoulder. And one turned to the other and said, you know, the thing about Brock is we all knew he didn't say a lot. You know, he's not a man of many words. But <laughs> he said, I didn't know that he was so small. I thought he would have been bigger. And that just made me smile because I'm like, it's, it's like that old thing, you know, where like you hear these stories about this big, bad person, this big, bad man. And and then when you see him in person, you're like, I thought you'd be bigger. It, it, that's what I thought. That's what I thought of when I heard these guys talking about Brock. And when you think about it, the kind of player that he is, uh, they would be justified to do so. And then one of them said, well, he does wear those 1990s size shoulder pads. And I had to laugh at that too, because that's my era. That was Kirby Smart's era of actually being a player. And so I knew exactly what they were talking about. So anyway, that just, I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, I, I thought he would be bigger. <laughs> oh my goodness. So with that, uh, you know, that's, that's just one of those things that you, you happen upon, you don't really expect to hear, but I heard it and I, I really did get a kick out of it. So we are uh, moving right along here, and, and I, can't, I can't leave out just yet without, uh, leave, I can't leave media days behind without sharing the parts about our team that I'm really impressed with. And that would be head coach Kirby Smart. He strode into the Grand Hyatt last Tuesday in a way that you're happy to see if you're a Georgia fan because Kirby did not look stressed. He did not look concerned. He looked very confident, and he looked like he knew he had a good team. The only question is, what is that team ultimately going to become? And so when he stepped to the microphone, both in the big hall as well as in front of the smaller assembled media, those things came through in his answers, and he didn't shy away, unlike some of the coaches. He did not shy away from some of the questions that he had been facing the most leading up to SEC Media Days, and we all know what that is. And last couple of years, Kirby has stepped right up there and delivered some bombs as far as the messaging for his team, like this one. We will not be hunted at the University of Georgia. I can promise you that. That one's fantastic, and I love it, and we play it all the time, and it was exactly what his team did in 2022. And in 2023, he had a different plan. There's a new message. And so I wanted to share some of that stuff with you this week just to sort of let you know where the team is headed, how the coach is talking to them, and maybe we'll have a better idea of what to expect when the team hits the field here in just a few weeks. Better never rests. We believe that. Those are strong words now when you think about it. Think deep on it. Better never rests. Our kids understand it. Our kids have learned it. What drives us for this season is intrinsic motivation. 
We're not going to be controlled by outside narratives and what people say and, and who's going to be the quarterback. The intrinsic motivation comes from within and what we decide to do. This team, the 2023 team, is still defining itself. We don't know where that goes. That happens over the course of the rest of the summer and fall camp, but I like where it's at. I love the buy-in. I love the fact these guys love being around each other and they love competing and they love football. Now, believe me when I tell you that when Kirby dropped that one on everybody and beforehand, he explained where it came from. And the whole idea was about complacency and what Georgia's doing to get ready for the 2023 season. And everyone sort of knew Kirby came locked and loaded with some sort of new messaging. And that one is one that resonated with everyone in there. The minute he dropped it, you could sort of feel the buzz about that because it's short, it's quick, it's punchy. And it gets the point across, you know, straight away. So he hit a home run with that messaging. And as we listen to the players talk, and when we listen to Kirby talk the rest of his time in Nashville, that was the point, that was the theme that came up again and again and again. And as I said, this whole conversation was sort of wrapped in the idea of, is Georgia going to be complacent going into 23, right? They're back-to-back. Uh, they're SEC champions last year. They're back-to-back -back national champions. So what are they going to be able to do to keep that edge? And Kirby, again, he just answered it head on. I've never said that anybody thought our team was going to be 7-5. and five. We expect to be good at University of Georgia. We won't sustain success. So we have to do that by winning every day. And that's not going to change whether we win it or not this year. The threat for us is compl complacency. The first thing you have to do is acknowledge that it's a threat. When you see complacency take over, it's when a team's enthusiasm and ego start worrying about outcomes. That's not what we do at Georgia. That's not what we bring into our place. That's not what we bring into the culture we want to have. We want selfless people who love football, and that's what we build around. I don't care about the three-peat, the two-peat, or the one-peat. I care about complacency. And if the focus is on that and outcomes, I think the rest will take care of itself in terms of, of allowing our guys to focus on, on, on being the best they can be. And the key takeaway there is that he he's just trying to keep the main thing the main thing. What is important now? And he went on to say at one point in here, you know, we're only focused on the next 24 hours. We're worried about being the best we can be right now. And that sort of focus is what allows them to maintain their edge inside the building. Now, if you're going to be at the University of Georgia and not be paid to be there, like a coach, it takes a special type of person to live up to that kind of standard. And so Kirby took a few minutes to explain the kind of players that they look for at the University of Georgia in their recruiting process. You start by like developing good people and bringing good people in. I just talked about it on the main floor, but we look for two characteristics, people that love football and people that embrace a selfless role. Once you do that, they don't have complacency because they have the right, the right hardwiring. So, uh, you know, people that worry about outcomes, like, oh gosh, my ego, why am I not getting the ball? Or like, oh man, we lost the game. Complacency sets in on those people because when they hit a milestone, they don't know how to respond to it. Um, so we want people that are intrinsically motivated. It means they come from inside out and they want to be great regardless of that. Now, do we have all players like that? No, we're trying to move our needle to get the majority that way so that we can stomp out that complacency. And we just want to be as dominant and as good as we can be. And that starts with competing against each other. Now that bit there at the end, I found to be especially poignant because in the days of NIL and transfer portal, there are a lot of people who have a lot to say about the reason players decide to transfer from one school to another, uh, whether or not something may or may not be a good fit and Kirby, again, he did not back away from any of these topics. He addressed them head on, and he said, listen, every person in our program is not that way right now, but we're working to move that way, which means that if, you know, hopefully they can adjust someone's personality, they can adjust an attitude and outlook, show them the value in being at the University of Georgia, but if they can't and the priorities are all messed up, then Kirby has zero issues telling someone that maybe you ought to find a new place to be. And there have been some players that have left, you know, and I, you have to think that this message was made very clear to them as well. So that's not, I'm not casting aspersions on anyone in particular. I'm just saying that once you have a little perspective 
on what they're looking for inside the program, it helps you to understand more about, you know, where the program is when they have people who decide to transfer out or transfer in because it works both ways. Now, one of the other things that Kirby took a second to address, and I really sort of enjoyed this one because it, you know, when you do stuff like this, when you're out here as a public face and you're talking about my university, I'm an alumnus of the university, a proud graduate. Um, I've been a dog fan my whole life. And when you're a person like me and you're out here talking about these kind of things, there's always somebody that's going to have something to say to you about it, right? And this is a situation where Kirby just sort of, one of the things you hear, it, he didn't bring this up on his own. He was asked the question. But one of the things that someone like me hears a lot of is, you know, built Bam, built by Bama or Nick is the reason Georgia is good, which is just ridiculous. I mean, it's just flat out ridiculous. And Kirby has said time and time again, he has tremendous respect for Nick Saban. He enjoyed his time in Alabama, but that has nothing to do with what he's doing in Athens right now. So he had the opportunity to let that be known at SEC Media Days, and as a true pro, he handled it very well, and he addressed it head on. I wouldn't compare. I, I think the two uh, circumstances are very different, um, two different programs um, led by different people. What we're doing right now is, is, is based on the players and the people in the organization we have, not uh, anything relevant to, to what we had when I was there. I say let them know, Kirby. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Told them how about them fucking dogs? That's what I told them. Hey, it's 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 all about Georgia. It's not about anybody else. It's not about who they play. It's not about who uh, any of the coaches on the staff have worked for in the past. It's about Georgia and what Georgia can do to be the best version of Georgia it can be. And that is the sort of message that's being delivered to those players every day. And again, if you want to better understand the program and understand why they do the things they do the way they do them, it's insight like this that gives you that sort of idea, right? It helps you as the fan have a window into what it is that's going on inside the building. Now, again, I mentioned earlier, and Kirby spoke on it in the previous soundbite, not everybody is cut out to be at the University of Georgia because the way they do things is just different than the way everyone else does things right now. And again, we have Kirby looking right at the camera telling you that there are certain things that are important in the success at his program. And one of those is retention. So here's Kirby Smart on keeping good people around the program. Every full-time coach on this year's staff was on last year's staff. Tell me the last time a national championship team can say that. Retention is the key to sustaining success. We can't do that without a supportive administration, and we sure as hell can't do that without a great culture of people wanting to be part of our program and pour it into our kids. You teach kids, you, you show them evidence that like work works. Like we say hard work works. Like if you work really hard and you buy into the team concept and you contribute some kind of way, your, your time's coming, you're gonna play. We've had a lot of freshmen go out and start and play. And I think there's a misnomer that when you recruit well, that means you have to sit and wait. We started two true freshmen last year on defense, the very first game. Um, so when you recruit talented people and you got people that are selfless, that love the game, you've got an opportunity to, to have uh, good success. Now, there it is. I mean, he just told you the secret sauce in Athens. He is trying to make the best environment for his players, for his coaches, and for their families that he can build in Athens. That sort of environment is what that and being, you know, empowered in the process. That's the sort of thing that is making players and coaches, the best people in the college football business today, want to be a part of what's going on in Athens. So as any good CEO would do, he recognized the shifting landscapes around college football, developed a plan, made a priority choice, and is working every day to drive that point home. And I, again, you see the results. He's clearly figured out what works for he and his staff right now. And one of those people, speaking of retention, one of the people that made a huge decision in earlier this spring, uh, in the winter of 2023, uh, to come back to the program, 
was senior center Cedric Van Pran. And I said at the time that was a mammoth decision for him to choose to come back and be the the guy who's going to lead that offensive line and breaking in a new quarterback, lead that offense, especially early in the season. And there have been a lot of good stories about Cedric. He's been one of my favorites since he's been there. Um, but Kirby shared a story at SEC Media Days that he hadn't shared with anyone about Cedric, and it's not that old. It's just from the week of the national championship game earlier this year. So I wanted to share that with you here today and just sort of, again, give you a little insight into the kind of person and the kind of player that Cedric Van Pran is and just how lucky we are to have him uh, as a member of the Georgia Bulldogs. We were at SoFi having the first practice for TCU. I was frustrated. I was on the mic. We weren't practicing well. We had a little bit of maybe jet lag. I felt like we weren't practicing good. And I said on the mic, you're practicing like you don't want to be here. Nobody here is practicing like they want to be here. And then after practice, of course, I'd forgotten. I said it an hour earlier. I walked by and Cedric tapped me on the shoulder and said, Coach Mark, you really hurt my feelings when you said that I didn't want to practice and didn't want to be here. And I thought, this dude is serious, and he remembers everything you say, and it matters to him. He cares about this team a lot, and it means a lot to him, and he's one of the best leaders I've ever been around. Now that tells you a lot. A, because Kirby is obviously a veteran coach and has seen a lot of great players in his day. But B, it tells us more about the person that Cedric is. And again, it's someone, he is someone, he is the type of player, very impressive in person. Like, you cannot overstate how impressive he is to speak to on a one-on-one -on -one situation. That's the kind of player that is the perfect ambassador for the University of Georgia and the kind of player that is the perfect example of what it takes to be successful at a place like the University of Georgia. So chalk me up as a big fan of Cedric Van Pram. Now, one of the other things that Kirby addressed, and it, it – Brought up, you know, it got some people smiling and laughing a little bit when it happened, and it certainly has in the days since he said it. But Kirby took the opportunity behind the mic to let everybody know that, you know, again, people are going to say what they're going to say. Kirby and the staff, they're not worried about it. But people like me and you as Georgia fans hear this all the time, and it has to do with the strength of schedule that Georgia's going to play here in 2023. Now, we all know the real deal about what happened there. Oklahoma was on the schedule for week two on the road, and that game had to be forfeited, or not forfeited, but taken off the schedule uh, and replaced with late in the process with the best team that was available. And as it turned out, that was Ball State for Georgia this year. But that should have been Oklahoma. That's old news. We all know that. But Kirby knows the narrative is out there, and someone put it to him as a direct question during media days. And Curry just, Kirby just had this to say about it. <laughs> and come play it. I mean, I, I'd love to invite any team in the country who wants to play in the SEC, come, 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 come right ahead, you know. And, um, and I, I don't get into comparisons year to year, but I'm, I'm a big believer in opening with a, a great game, a great kickoff game. We've done that repeatedly. We've scheduled that out. I think we got UCLA, Ohio State, FSU, Louisville, all in coming years. Um, Clemson next year. Uh, we had Oregon, and um, we had Clemson before that. So a lot of things I can control. I don't control the narrative that people create outside of our building. Tell them, Kirby. I, I, I mean, you can't do it any better than that. And the reason that made me so happy is because I, that's exactly what I tell people all the time. I'm like, listen, if you think that the SEC schedule is so soft, bring your team down here and play it. Would you trade your schedule this year for Georgia's? I've been saying that for six months. I've yet to have one person tell me that they would want their team to come and play that schedule. But when nobody's looking, they're going to take pot shots in chat rooms and stuff like that about it uh, to give you and me and other Georgia fans a hard time. The reality is, and this is just my opinion, uh, well, my this is my opinion, but it is also the reality. At the end of the day, strength of schedule is what it is. Everybody has to go line up and play. The season is long. Things happen. At the end of the day, though, if you play and beat every team on your schedule, then you get into the playoffs. 
Your metal will be tested. We will find out who you are and what that team is about. If Georgia's good enough, they will handle their business in the semifinal, make it back to the national title game, and hopefully win a third consecutive national championship. If they don't do that, then we're going to find out. Bottom line, it will play out on the field. So I'm not concerned about it, but I certainly did appreciate the fact that Kirby wanted to step up and sort of just say it, just call their bluff, if you will, because that's one of those things that everybody seems to want to talk about, but nobody actually wants to, you know, own up to talking about. But some people are more overt about it than others. But either way, I was happy to see that uh, Kirby had something to say about it. So there is that. And with that said, I mean, let's just take a look, right? Let's go ahead and look at it. So I can call it up for you here. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the schedules that Georgia has in front of them here. Georgia is not running from anyone, okay? For years, they have scheduled well, home and home and neutral site. They've played Arizona State, uh, just, you know, um, among... Um, one that I can think of that's furthest away from Athens, right? They traveled all the way out west to play Arizona State and a home and home. But look ahead here. We addressed the 2023 season and the Ball State game. That should have been Oklahoma, but it's not, and it is what it is. That's fine. You have the annual game against Georgia Tech. That's your out of conference. If we look at 24, you start to see what Kirby was talking about. The dogs jump right back into it. They're going to play Clemson in Atlanta. Then they're going to have... Georgia Tech uh, at the end of the season. So that's the out-of-conference there. 25, not a neutral site. They have scheduled a home-and-home home against UCLA, who at that point will be in the Big Ten. And look, that is not a regional game. The dogs are going to get on the airplane and fly all the way out to California to play a home-and-home home with UCLA. Uh, they're also going to play Georgia Tech again to end the season. And in 26, there's the return trip for the UCLA game. Western Kentucky, which is a program that is not a pushover. Then you have on the road another home-and-home home with Louisville. Get the first leg of that scheduled. Then you end the season with Georgia Tech. 27, there's Florida State with, guess what, another home-and-home. And, home. and that one's going to be on the road. Notice the dogs aren't, don't seem to be getting many of these first games at home. These seem to be where they're going on the road to play anybody, anywhere that they can get a good quality game scheduled with. So 27 they play Florida State, and then they have Louisville at home, and then also the annual game with Georgia Tech, who, by that point, listen, I don't enjoy the techies, okay? But Brent Key is a Georgia Tech person. He is a good football coach. I believe Georgia Tech is going to be better. So when you look at Georgia Tech a year or two down the road, that is not going to be the same program that it is right now. They won't be on Georgia's level, I wouldn't imagine, but it's certainly not going to be the dumpster fire that had been under Collins the last couple of years. So looking at 28, you have Florida A&M, assuming that they're playing football at that point. You have uh, a game against Florida State. That's the return trip on that game. You, again, you have the annual game with Georgia Tech. Then in 29, guess who's back? Clemson. At Clemson. Home and home. Again, 30. You have Clemson. Oh, and look, there's Ohio State. Way down in September on the 14th, Ohio State comes between the hedges in 2030. 2031, we're looking at the return trip for Ohio State. The dogs go to the shoe. They're going to play Western Carolina. 32, Clemson's back on the schedule. 33, it's at Clemson again. A game against NC State. Then you have the Tech game at the end of the year. 34, it's at NC State. So they're on the road again in a home-and-home. Home. As you can see, the dogs do not have a problem with scheduling tough opponents out of conference, okay? So if anybody wants to talk to you about that sort of stuff, you feel free to let them know that they are just, I don't know, misguided, misinformed, however you want to talk about it. But you can let them know what's up. So with that, let's shift gears just a little bit. And we're still sort of looking back at what happened over the last uh, week or so. And the dogs, after being on fire in recruiting in the month of June and in July, 
there was a little bit of a lull. It's been, you know, a few days since the dogs had a big commitment. But that was rectified yesterday when five-star linebacker, five-star plus linebacker, sorry, excuse me, Justin Williams out of Texas committed to the University of Georgia as the highest-rated linebacking prospect to ever commit to the Bulldogs. 6'2", 210 from Conroe, Texas. He chose the dogs over Oregon. Uh, primarily, Texas and Alabama were in there too. But Justin Williams, if you haven't yet, do yourself a favor. Go check out his tape online. You can find it with a quick Google search. Check out this young man. He is quite the athlete, quite the player. And here's what he had to say about playing at Georgia, why he chose Georgia. A school like Georgia, there's going to be competition. It's not just sunshine and rainbows. They don't lay out the red carpet for you. Georgia is going to battle, but it's going to be a battle, but it's going to be worth it. And that comes to us per Steve Wiltfong of 247. Clearly, this young man understands what it takes to play at the University of Georgia. And he has his head right. And I think he very well could be, notice the video playing on your screen here, this is uh, some video of Roquan Smith that I published earlier this week. Just check it out. This is the kind of player that Justin Williams could be for the dogs. Fast, aggressive, sideline to sideline, gets downhill in a hurry and will punish you when he arrives. This is a huge pickup for Georgia. And in case you hadn't noticed, just today, the dogs did lose uh, a commitment uh, from a linebacker out of Alabama, but it had been rumored for um, over a month that he might be making that move. So it's just like the dogs, right, to have a kid decommit or choose another school and then not sweat it at all. Let's just go out and get the best player at the position to fill that slot that those players had or were going to have. So that is quite the statement. The dogs are just staying on fire when it comes to recruiting. They have the number one recruiting class in the country right now, and it's not close. And if you look at what's to come here, check it out. Another linebacker, Chris Cole, has just been uh, on the uh, Dogs HQ recruiting prediction machine, has just been tabbed to be leaning towards Georgia. They think he's going to be a bulldog. So they're going to get another middle linebacker in there in this class. And if you look at this stat right here, this should tell you everything you need to know about what George is doing on the recruiting trail this year. They currently have committed the number one quarterback in the nation for the 2024 class, the number one cornerback, the number one linebacker, the number two tight end. And then if you look down, you'll see that the name still here on the target board, Williams and Wary, KJ Bolden at safety, and Nathaniel Frazier at running back. All of those guys are the number one player at their position. It is conceivable that the dogs could land all three. I mean, just look at that. Can you imagine the number one quarterback, the number one cornerback, the number one linebacker, the number one defensive lineman, the number one safety, as well as the number one running back in the country for 2024 all in one class? That, my friends, is what you call crushing it. So Kirby and his staff are getting it done out there on the recruiting trail. And just a little bit of an extra thing here for you. This popped up on my timeline today. I want to throw this in there. Reports out of the Philadelphia Eagles camp as they open camp here for the 2023 season is that Jalen Carter, the Eagles' number one draft pick, and I want to quote this here because I don't want to mess it up. They say that Jalen Carter is shredding the Eagles' prolific first-team offensive line in training camp. He regularly beats world-class vets, and it's hard not to think we didn't get the best player in the NFL draft. So not only was he great between the hedges, Jalen Carter is doing big things. Looks like he's going to fit in perfectly in Philadelphia with that Bulldogs defense, and uh, things are just rolling right along if you are – a Georgia Bulldog these days. And that's how we like it. That's the only way we want it to be. So while I'm over here on the page, let's just jump over here. I want to point out to you, if you're not over here, if you're not following us, do me a favor. Come on over to Instagram. Follow us over there. Look at all this really cool stuff that you're going to find. We appreciate you being here with us this evening, and I would love it if you all would come and join us over on the gram. 
because we do good stuff over there too. And while we're here, let's take a look around. In case you didn't know, did you know that you can get a Damn Beast Associated merchandise to wear to Georgia Games this year? Look at this here. Got stuff commemorating uh, the national championship from the last two years. Q wearing the crown. He's right there for you. Go find the color you like. You can find all these links in the description below. This one's perfect for the ladies, but actually I've seen quite a few young men who really said that they liked it. Sorry, can't. Dogs are playing. Bye. I love it. That one was great. You can get the crowns here, dual crowns resting on the number one, all sorts of cool Georgia gear and much more right there for you if you're interested in it. Again, all the links to this stuff is in the description down below. Be sure to check it out. So there we go. We have taken a nice long look at what happened at SEC Media Days last week. We've touched on recruiting. And as we turn our attention toward uh, the month of August, as I mentioned off the top, I'm really starting to get excited. I'm starting to feel good about what it is and where we are as we head into the season. Coach Smart and the team, from what we saw from them in Nashville last week, they are confident. They are feeling good as we head into the season. So everything seems to be looking up for the University of Georgia right now. So it's just one of those things that if you're not paying attention to what's going on, make sure that you do because these are the glory days for Georgia football. I am 47 years old, and it has never been better than it is right now to be a Georgia Bulldog. So please make sure you're paying attention. Enjoy it. Soak it all in. Because the cold hard truth is nothing lasts forever. This won't either. Now, does that mean that Georgia's going anywhere, that they're not going to be competitive? Absolutely not. These dogs are built to sustain. They're going to be in it every year. I have zero doubt about that. But with that said, things do change. The ball bounces funny sometimes. It's shaped funny. There's not much we can do about that. You don't always get the breaks. You could have an unfortunate injury. All that aside, Georgia is in a really good place right now, and Kirby Smart is doing one hell of a job leading the dogs as the premier college football program in the country these days. Georgia is the standard, both in the SEC and in college football, whether people want to admit it or not. I appreciate all of you being here with us this week. Tonight, we decided to do something a little bit different. We decided to stream both on YouTube and Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, wonderful. Uh, I'm happy that you're here taking advantage of this live stream. If you're over on YouTube, that's wonderful. I'm happy that you're there as well. I appreciate you being here. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat, and we, we'll talk about them real quick if you have anything going on. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, we just are going to keep bringing you the live show the best way we know how. And if you have been following us over on the YouTube channel, and if you haven't subscribed over there, be sure that you do, because that's where a lot of the stuff that we do lands first. And that's everything from announcements to uh, various inter engaging polls and things like that that we do on the community page. So if you're not subscribed, be sure that you head over there and check that out and make sure that you are so that you don't miss out on anything. Um, but there's a lot of talk over there uh, about uh, what we're going to be doing as we head into the fall. Uh, there's a lot going on here with the Damn Beast Media. That we have big ideas. Being in Nashville last week showed us that as much as we're doing, and we are doing a lot already to bring you dogs content on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube, there is still much more that we can possibly do. And if you noticed, I shared some stuff on the community page this week over on YouTube to show you the sort of steps and upgrades that we're making to bring you the best show that we possibly can uh, here at A Damn Beast Media. So I hope that comes through in the production value. I hope you have enjoyed the show tonight. I hope you like what you see and what we're doing. And if, if you do, Please do me a favor. If you feel like I've earned it, hit that like button, share the video, share the other videos with your friends, invite people to come and join us because this is a rapidly growing community here on YouTube, Facebook, uh, TikTok, and we just want all of Dog Nation to join us in raising it up and saying glory, glory, because there is no institution more worthy, as Larry Munson is famous for saying, than the University of Georgia. 
So again, friends, I appreciate you being here. Thank you for that. Um, And until next time, just know that I am always going to have this for you. Go dogs. Talk about the dogs. That's what I told them.